welcome everybody. Um, we're going now to a, uh, one of our sponsor updates. Uh, and so I feel honored to introduce Jeff Bernard from Bernard Software, uh, who's no stranger to the VM workshop. Uh, and most of you from a VSE environment probably have them on speed dial. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to you, Jeff. Thank you, thank you very much. Today, um, we don't have a really long session, so we thought we would uh, do a BSI update. We haven't, uh, we haven't done one of those in several years, so it sounded like a good idea. And uh, so we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the things we've worked on in the past year or so. So we'll jump right into it. Okay, just, just for review, we have uh, several products, OptiCache, OptiWorkload, OptiTape, OptiAudit, and all of those products are, are still in use by customers. And, um, and of course, IPv6 VSE. Um, some of you know that, have known that previously as uh, TCP IP tools. So bringing you current, current uh, official GA, which we don't really do anymore, uh, is build 257, uh, which is equivalent to uh, IBM's IPv6 VSE 1.3. And that actually dates at uh, August 2017. Where we currently are now is, is build 258 release 28. And we've, we have gone to rolling updates. So 258 rel 28 is build 258 release 28. And uh, all of the uh, new features and fixes are automatically included in each new release. Um, they're, no patches. Everything is incorporated into source, and it's pretty similar to the way uh, VC is uh, six two is doing it with their their rolling update process. Some of the stuff that we've been working on. Um, one thing that we had a real real fun with was using Space Switch PC support uh, in VC, and we actually have a manual uh, that's available in our downloads. Uh, program call experimental support supplement guide shows you how to uh, enable the support and disable the support. Um, in, in the fun that we had doing it is limited support by VC for space switch program calls. There's a very little you can do. Um, support in VC is limited to whatever CICS TS needs and um, it's not much. But uh, in the process of learning all that, um, we discovered a way you can actually uh, you save about 20% of CPU uh, using a program call to queue the request to the stack, as opposed to using the old method of, you know, posting and turning on a bit, posting and all that sort of thing. Um, it's a little bit more efficient all the way around. Um, we added uh, selective AC on and off for selective AC. Um, some of you may know what that is, but if you don't, it's a method that TCP has for um, transmitting only those segments that need to be retransmitted um, in the selective act portion of the header. Uh, it actually tells you what the uh, sequence numbers of the missing data is. So you can actually just retransmit that, that portion of the sequence set that is actually missing. Um, pretty nice for retransmission. Uh, eliminates a lot of duplicate retransmission. Um, we've added some VC power messages. When you queue a job to reader, we've had a uh, customer who wanted to know what the uh, the queue and the class and the number and the name um, that was assigned to the reader entry or to the list queue entry for that matter. Um, uh, FTP, our bash FTP alias commands, um, pretty standard stuff there. And a while back, we got a request from another vendor, Vertel, um, to add IO control. And that looks like a bunch of garbage there. But what it actually does is allow an application to extract the TLS uh, client certificate information um, and retrieve that so they can process it. Useful in applications uh, like Vertel's, which is uh, basically uh, allows web browser connections uh, 3270 emulation, um, pretty slick product. Um, but there, if you're using SSL connections and using our uh, automatic TLS facility, then you want to, the application will want to be able to extract that uh, client certificate. 
a lot of fun with that one. Um, added loop back package to our capture facility. Uh, prior to that, it was sort of capturing what went out on the wire rather than what happened internally. Made some adjustments for a large MT sizes like hop hyper sockets at the same time. We had a customer uh, that wanted to be able to have multiple uh, VTAM emulation menus, emulated VTAM menus uh, within the same Telnet server. And so now you can actually run essentially an unlimited number of VTAM emulation menus and, and direct them as needed, all of the same uh, Telnet server. Uh, we added FTP passive port range support for the FTP server. Had a customer that uh, wanted Prot C, that is, um, we're going to protect only the command connection on an FTP connection and not the data connection. Um, interestingly enough, uh, SSL overhead on the command connection isn't really that big a deal, but, but if you're transferring large files, uh, encrypting it with SSL, and of course, having to do the decryption, uh, it takes a lot of CPU and it does slow down the transfer rate when you do that. So being able to say, I only want to protect the command connection uh, allows you to transfer the data in the clear, but much faster. Uh, passive command support in the automatic telnet, t automatic TLS facility, um, since it's going to be providing uh, FTP connection support. You have to be able to handle uh, passive command port, ports there. And we updated the, uh, the automatic TLS facility to handle 2,000 encrypted sockets simultaneously. And we updated, uh, at the, nearly the same time, we updated the uh, our, our PSTT VNet TN3270 server to uh, support 4,000 uh, telnet sessions. Um, ended up having to do some fun stuff there. Uh, storage redesign. Um, we I originally designed it, not thinking about 4,000 sessions, and putting certain control blocks in 24-bit and then data buffers, et cetera, in 31-bit. But it turns out that when you try to try to have 4,000 sessions, that that 24-bit just not enough. You got to move everything above the line. So ran into two. Two strange PCOM bugs um, from a customer that was converting from uh, Microsoft's SNA server. The, um, the PCOM would, would occasionally uh, just begin streaming data out of memory. And you would see the 3270 data stream, and then there'd be more memory and more memory and more memory. And finally, it would blow uh, the, the receiving buffers on in the that server. So uh, we were able to had to make an update to fix that. It's amazing what, you know, a branch equal is really not the same as a branch not high. So, but fixing that bug was pretty interesting, but but um, PCOM had to be updated to not do it. Otherwise, uh, all we can do in a situation like that is basically terminate the session. Um, Microsoft SNA server ever seemed to do something different with it. Um, they would, they would actually accept, we would write out a 3270 data stream, or rather CSS would write out a 3270 data stream, and SNA server would take it and send it off to the Telnet client, no problem. But when we we took the data and sent off the identical identical 3270 data stream to the client, the client would croak. And it turns out that uh, updates to PCOM actually fixed, fixed those issues. Um, so interesting, challenging uh, period of time trying to figure out what was going on there. The, uh, we added a new facility uh, at the request of some customers, a secondary log file. Uh, secondary log file is a, a SAM of uh, fixed unblocked records. It basically just takes the log, the syslist log being generated and writes it to a disk file. Um, if the DLBL is present in the JCL, we automatically do it. If there's no DLBL for the for that job, then then uh, it doesn't get done. Uh, it's obviously only for batch applications and not designed to be used for 
for uh, servers. Um, I can't imagine trying to uh, create a secondary log file for the stack. That that would could be a very fairly large file over the over days and months, weeks and months that that uh, messages are written out. We um, we support um, uh, input and output commands uh, for SAM files. And you can simply say that it, the SAM file is an EPIC or a DYNAM file. And we go out to the EPIC or DYNAM uh, catalog and extract the, the type of file it is. Is it a fixed block or variable block? And what's the block size and record size and so on? And so we added that support for SAM vSAM uh, to extract the record size, block size, et cetera, uh, from the vSAM catalog. Very useful. Less don't have to real, really know what the, uh, what the program was expecting in those cases. Um, we had a customer, actually it was Tony, said, hey, I don't want to actually code a hard code that ID, the stack ID, I want to put it in JCL. So uh, ID sysparm uh, what came into play. Uh, it uses the ID value from the option sysparm uh, statement. So that was a cute little update. We've actually updated the uh, rec text to PDF uh, recs procedure that we that we provide uh, up to uh, version 20.15. Um, and we did that because the uh, that's this is an open source product entirely written in Rex that generates uh, takes text input and creates PDF documents and it supports a lot of things like compression and encryption and and uh, a lot of stuff including um, true type external fonts but uh, we had to upgrade because there was actually a bug in the support for true type external fonts and uh, in the process of doing that uh, we actually added support for actually using the font um, which was a lot of fun it's uh we provide a, a manual for that along with the uh, text to pdf manual that uh, is provided by the authors of the rex exec so Pretty slick little open source project. Um, had a customer that uh, wanted to be able to store their startup in a library member. Never had anybody asked for that before. Uh, turned out to be pretty pretty easy, uh, but you can read the stack startup from a library member. Normally it gets read from sysipped. Um, and in fact, you can actually put the part of the in a library member and then and then there's actually a directive to tell it to read the rest of it from SysIP if you're so inclined. So a lot of fun doing that one. The uh, one of the bigger updates we've done recently is to our automatic uh, uh, TLS facility and and our proxy facility. And IBM announced uh, DUI four seven eight two five fairly recently and. That support allows uh, allows you to use OpenSSL 1.1.1D, and 1.1.1 series is uh, the long-term support version um, of OpenSSL, and it'll be supported until uh, September 11th, 2023. Um, currently, uh, prior to that APAR, um, we were using OpenSSL 1.0.2H which is a good release, uh, but it is currently out of support. So uh, some of the new stuff that's available in 1.1.1, which surprisingly enough is a complete rewrite um, of the OpenSSL project. I mean, it's there's there's a lot of new code. Um, some of it obviously was very easy to change, but a lot of it changed a lot. Um, and it has greater uh, portability, um, better performance, uh, supporting lots of stuff than in new encrypted crypto methods and all that sort of thing. Uh, so a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of work went into that by IBM, and so we also support uh, that that APAR DY four seven eight two five. Tell you, we had a lot of fun with that too. So Jeff, sorry to interrupt. There's a couple of questions in the chat here for you. Um, in the chat? 
Yeah, so so one is, uh, is the online doc updated to show these new updates like the PARM option on IP stack startup? Say that question again, please. Is the online doc updated to show these new updates um, like the PARM option on the IP stack startup? Yeah, but only only in the last release, it released 28. Okay. Uh, that's documented only in that in that latest update. We just did that. Okay. And the question was earlier on provide an APAR for releasing the 258 uh, rel 28. Um, I don't know the answer to that question. You'd have to ask IBM that. Um, but great, I'll try to find an IBM one. <laughs> Um, this is Gonzalo. I have asked that question already to the CVSE team. Um, I realize also that the, there is um, on the latest A parts that are provided is not listed there. So I, I already follow up that with the team and we'll get that to that. And we'd be happy to provide that with, to, to IBM if they, if they want it. But they've actually been, we've been talking uh, with IBM about just providing a link uh, to our website where, where IBM can. Basically, here's a link to the latest latest uh, update from from, my, from BSI, and you know they can just install it. So, but we can we can uh, discuss that at any, with IBM anytime. So, okay, thanks, Jeff. I think that's all the questions uh, in the chat for now. Sorry, yeah, these are all new toys. Lots of lots of new stuff. I didn't go back more than a year or so. Um, we actually uh, have a number of Opti workload customers, and uh, up until recently, we didn't support uh, workload management under CICSTS. We only we only supported it under CICSDC, and of course, that's been out of support for some time now. And uh, so, we only support CICSTS workload management now. Um, older releases of Opti workload do support CICSDC if you're still inclined or still running that. Um, and I put a link there to the blog that we have about uh, workload management uh, uh, under under CSTS. The part of that is that's really interesting is that the priority aging that's provided by uh, CSTS is, I think, has limited usefulness. Um, it, it doesn't age very quickly, and you have to set the the duration. Um, very, very short, um, and then it's only a temporary priority adjustment. It may adjust uh, your priority up to get you uh, some additional priority, but only for the next dispatch of your of your transaction, and then it goes back to normal. What what workload management we do is is you specify a range of priorities that you want us to to uh, to monitor. And you might say, I want you to look at transactions in between priority 10 and 50. And transactions that are less than 10 or transactions that are higher than 50 in priority as defined by you, um, we don't touch those. But in the meantime, uh, those that are, that are running in those, we, we actually look at their workload, how many units of work. Um, and that's basically defined as the amount of work that was done in between um, an exact CICS call. Um, and so that's a unit of work. It's a fairly arbitrary thing, but you have to define something. And if you use more than an average, say, some number of units of work, then it will go in there and perhaps lower your priority by one priority increment. And if you continue to use a lot, do a lot of work, you really want to lower it again. And Or if you're starving for work, that is, you're not getting a chance to run, then we'll increment your priority up to a certain point. So the idea is to look at um, a velocity, that is how much work is getting done, um, and then high velocity transactions um, over time, they tend to drift lower in order to allow uh, other transactions to get the priority and the resources they need. Overall, uh, a long running, perhaps we would say a batch job that's running as a CICS transaction will drift lower while inquiry type transactions would, would be in and out and and the impact of that long running 
batch transaction uh, would be minim minimized uh, in, in terms of its impact on, on shorter transactions. So we had a lot of fun uh, getting into uh, the internals of CICS TS and looking at how the dispatcher worked and all the different queues and how things are done. And all that, a lot of that information is covered in the uh, uh, workload management uh, uh, log that I wrote uh, in, a, in a year or so now. But, but uh, a lot of information that we learned there about, about how CSS actually manages uh, priorities and how Optic Workload manages it uh, uh, in assisting, assisting you in managing it. So, but for us, that about covers the BSI update. And if anybody else has any questions, they're welcome to, to chat, text me or email me. Um, my, my cell phone number is right there. So if you want to shoot me a text, you can do that, or you can shoot me an email. Um, and uh, it's sort of been a pleasure to be in front of you, virtually speaking. All right, great. Well, thank you very much, Jeff. Have a great day, everyone.